everyone, and welcome to Constructed Chaos. Today, we're shaping up the druid with every one of their wild and broken features in D&D 5e. In a game where every class has some access to similar or the same features as another, the druid separates itself as a spellcaster with some truly unique properties that make them extremely versatile, flavorful, and powerful in many facets of D&D 5e. You'll typically draw most of your magical abilities from the landscapes and wildlife around you, forming a sort of reverence for the majesty and power of nature that trends towards religious dogma. Druids are known for this kind of thing, so it likely won't surprise anyone to find that they operate as arbitrary of balance between all natural elements of the world. So not just the green stuff. Druids can be devoted to raging fires, whipping winds, and flashing lightning just as well. But aside from being the generic nature person of the party, you can do just about anything with this class as a sneaky spy, a battlefield controlling spellcaster, or even a tanky frontliner. It's all pretty standard with the druid. But first let's start at the beginning. For the most part, your druid will function as a wisdom based spellcaster, so you'll probably want wisdom as your highest ability, followed by constitution for the plethora of concentration spells you'll probably want to make use of. But more on that in just a bit. From there, you can really prioritize your stats as you see fit. I usually like a decent dexterity score with a lower charisma and intelligence, and a really low strength score. Sure, you could opt for something else here since you may want to play your character a little differently, but I'd still stick with strength as the bottom score as you'll have plenty of opportunities to just wild shape into something stronger if you need to anyway. But what shape should be your default one? Well, naturally you'll want something that gives you a decent boost to your wisdom and or constitution scores, so options like the Hill Dwarf, Lizard Folk, Furbolg, and Wood Elves make great picks, unless you'd rather utilize the optional custom origin rules from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything so you can assign your bonuses anywhere you'd like. Regardless, you'll begin your adventure as a druid with a D8 hit die and 8 plus your constitution modifier and starting hit points, which is just as much as we can ask of any full caster class anyway. You'll also pick up proficiency in light and medium armor, shields, clubs, daggers, darts, javelins, maces, quarterstaffs, scimitars, sickles, slings, spears, and the herbalism kit, intelligence, and wisdom saving throws, and any two skills from arcana, animal handling, insight, medicine, nature, perception, religion, and survival. Though you should make note here that the rules technically specify that druids don't wear metal armor or shields specifically. They're fine with metal weapons and jewelry apparently, just not armor. I mean, aren't minerals and metals part of nature too? This one's kind of a source of contention in the community, so I won't argue too much here. Just check with your DM before donning some shiny pants, in case they really can't budge on this ruling. Assuming they don't, you'll get a wooden shield or any simple weapon, a scimitar or any simple melee weapon, leather armor, an explorer's pack, and a druidic focus as your starting equipment. You'll also gain access to the secret language of druids, aptly called druidic, that appears to be slightly less useful than something like Thieves' Cant, but may come in handy if your DM gives you secret messages left behind by other druids via hidden means that others can only detect with a DC 15 perception check and still can't decipher without magic. But rather than tie yourself down with this mostly flavor feature, what you'll really want is the druid spellcasting, which they unlock right away at level one. Now, there are a few things to note about this. Firstly, the druid is a prepared spellcaster, so you'll be able to select a number of spells equal to your druid level, plus your wisdom modifier when you finish a long rest that you'll be able to cast until the next time you prepare spells. Your spell attack modifier as a druid will be your proficiency bonus plus your wisdom modifier, and your spell save DC will be that number plus eight. At this point, you'll also get two cantrips from the druid spell list and two first level spell slots that you can use to cast your spells and that replenish when you finish a long rest, but you'll also get more of these later. Here's a handy chart showcasing your cantrips known and your spell slots as they relate to your druid level. But as for those cantrips, you may want to consider taking Guidance, Shillelagh, Produce Flame, or Primal Savagery depending on your build. You could also consider taking Druidcraft if you really want, but it's mostly going to be an engine for flavor. It's hardly a must-have despite the name. Now, without wasting any time, let's move on to level two, arguably the most important level for a druid. It is at this point that you'll 
unlock your wild shape feature, the hallmark of the druid class that gives it such a unique and flavorful place within the party. Using this ability, you'll be able to use an action to magically transform into a beast that you've seen before. You'll have two uses of this feature that come back on a short rest, and there is a limit when it comes to how strong your wild shape can be at any given point. For example, at this point, your druid will only be able to wild shape into a beast with a maximum challenge rating of one quarter and no flying or swimming speeds, like a wolf. Here's a chart that denotes if and when those restrictions change later on, but you might be wondering, what's a challenge rating? This is a challenge rating. Creature stat blocks all have them, and your DM likely uses them to some degree to balance encounters with you and the rest of your party. Is it a terribly accurate measurement of a creature's abilities? Not really, but it is still what limits your wild shapes. And yes, technically you will have to have seen the animal you're transforming into first, so it could be a good idea to discuss with your DM your character having seen certain animals before your adventure gets going. Regardless, on top of knowing your spells and spellcasting, you're going to want to familiarize yourself with a few beast stat blocks from the back of the player's handbook or from the monster manual like this one, or this one, or wait, how'd that get in there? Now, when you finally wild shape into a beast of appropriate challenge rating, you should know that you can stay in that shape for a number of hours equal to half your druid level rounded down, at which point you'll revert to your usual form unless you spend another use of wild shape. You can also revert at any time by using a bonus action and you'll revert automatically if you fall unconscious, including if you reach zero hit points or die. But now for the fun part. When in wild shape, your stats are exchanged with that of the beast you've changed into, aside from your intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. You'll also retain your personality and your skill in saving throw proficiencies in addition to any proficiency the creatures have. This doesn't mean you add up your proficiencies or anything crazy like that. You'll just use whatever bonus is higher from either source. Naturally, if the creature has any legendary or layer actions, you won't be able to use them, but you will get to use that creature's multi-attacks and abilities if available in addition to your own features from your class, race, or otherwise, so long as your new form is physically capable. Additionally, you won't be able to speak or take any actions that require hands, including casting spells, but you can retain your concentration and activate additional spell effects when you transform if you already have a spell active or one you're concentrating on. I told you you'd want that high constitution score. As for your gear, you'll choose if it falls to the ground in your space when you transform, if it merges into your new form without applying any benefits, or if it's worn by the new form. If it's worn, the equipment will function as usual, but your DM will have final say so as to whether the equipment is practical enough for your wild shape. And you might be surprised by how useful this last bit actually is. Try to grab yourself a cloak of displacement or a ring of protection that most of your wild shapes can wear, or- Whoa there. Sorry, adventurers, but no weapons beyond this point. Finally, and probably most importantly, you will assume a creature's hit points and hit die when you transform into it, and you'll have your hit point total from before you transformed whenever you revert back. Damage will carry over to your normal form if you revert as a result of dropping to zero hit points, but this is still extremely powerful and one of the most broken parts of Wild Shape. Entire builds can be crafted around turning into something with a ton of hit points to act as a damage sponge for the entire party while you utilize other actions spells. And even if you're not using Wild Shape in this way, it's important to realize just how flexible this feature can be. With just CR one quarter creatures, you can turn into a giant badger and just run from enemies with your burrow speed while sticking them with reoccurring damage from a spell. Or you can shift into a Velociraptor to deal out serious damage while also benefiting from pack tactics. Or try the giant wolf spider to get some incredible stealth rolls and a climbing speed. You can even just become a cat or a regular spider if you need to infiltrate a location unnoticed. As you can tell, Wild Shape is not just for combat, and this variability at the flip of a switch is what takes the druid from just another spellcaster to a creative problem solver that operates well within the bounds of fun roleplay at the table, just at level two. But things are just getting started, and I'll be sure to cover some more broken Wild Shape options for later levels. For now, let's delve into the other feature you get at this point, your druid circle subclass. Yeah, level two is a really big one for druids as you come into your own in a huge way, setting down a path that will unlock new features at second level when you take your subclass, as well as at sixth, 
10th, and 14th level. I'll cover each option briefly and most of the features for each, but I won't be able to cover every single thing. Instead, I'll be sure to link any videos that I make in the future that go into more detail or use these subclasses in a character build. First up, we have the Circle of Dreams Druid, an entry with strong connections to the Feywild. These druids place a focus on mending wounds of both the body and the soul as they extend the brightest and happiest parts of the Feywild into the material plane with a dreamlike flavor. Right away at second level, you'll gain a number of d6 dice equal to your druid level per long rest that can be utilized as a bonus action to heal a creature within 120 feet of you and grant them an additional temporary hit point per die used. This on-the-spot healing can be pretty nice, but it is worth Worth noting that the base druid class is one of the best healers in the game already with spells like Healing Word, Goodberry, and Revivify, so this isn't a feature we were exactly pining for. Though, as we move along, we'll later be able to create a sphere of shadowy protection during long and short rests that grant a plus 5 to stealth and perception checks, teleport as a bonus action up to 60 feet to a space you can see, or teleport another creature 30 feet wisdom modifier times per long rest, and eventually gain a free casting of dream, scrying, or teleportation circle back to the last place you long rested upon finishing a short rest. This final feature leaves a bit to be desired as well, since the druid will have access to scrying already and some decent teleportation using plane shift and tree stride. Even the bonus action teleport feature could mostly be replicated with Misty Step if you wanted to use a feat like Fate Touch to get it. All in all, this subclass can be a decent pick for you if you want to play a support or a healing druid, but it's not going to give you much that you didn't have already. Next, let's take a bit of a detour to the Circle of Spores druid that was introduced in Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica and reprinted in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. These druids bring an interesting flavor and mechanical divergence to the table as lovers of life, death, and even undeath. You see, the flow between these is all part of the natural cycle of life, and they call to their aid the nature of mold and other fungi. To begin, your druid will gain the Chill Touch cantrip as well as a spell list of always prepared spells that they'll have at their disposal, including entries like Animate Dead, Blight, Cloud Kill, and Contagion. While these options aren't all great, they certainly lend flavor to the subclass alongside two more features that you'll get at second level. You'll also be able to utilize your reaction and harmful spores that float around you to dish out 1d4 necrotic damage to creatures that move within 10 feet of you or start their turn there unless it succeeds a constitution saving throw against your spell save DC. The damage of this increases later to as much as 1d10 at 14th level, but what's really interesting is the other ability you get here. By utilizing your wild shape, your druid can channel nature magic into your spores for 10 minutes as you gain 4 temporary hit points per druid level and can then roll an extra die of damage using the previous feature as well as deal 1d6 extra necrotic damage with your weapon attacks. From there, you'll eventually be able to use a reaction to create a zombie from a corpse of a creature that dies within 10 feet of you, wisdom modifier times per long rest, hurl your spores as a bonus action to deal your spores damage without using your reaction from 30 feet away and finally become immune to the blinded, deafened, frightened, and poisoned conditions as well as turn any crit against you into a regular hit unless you're incapacitated. In contrast to our last subclass entry, this last feature is actually pretty sweet. Who doesn't like crit negation? However, the other features leading up to this call into question the overall viability of this subclass versus other options we'll cover in just a moment. The extra damage with your spores is nice, but is middling at best when we consider it utilizes our reaction and can be completely diminished if our enemies have good constitution scores. The zombie that we're able to conjure up at 6th level is unlikely to do much for us once we outgrow it, and the spore form we can take and stay of our typical wild shape seems cool on the surface until you consider that any wild shape already grants us temporary hit points and extra damage in a way. The only real benefit over the norm comes in the form of being able to cast spells since you aren't transforming into a beast in this case. But even this subclass can be a cool choice if you really like the flavor of it. Now let's chart the circle of stars, one of my personal favorites favorites on both mechanics and flavor. These druids conform to their namesake by drawing their powers from the stars above. Those of this circle map the patterns of the sky using a tiny star chart that acts as a spellcasting focus in such a way that they always
always know when and how to use the forces of the cosmos to their best advantage. And that starts when you get access to the Guidance Cantrip as well as Guiding Bolt as an always prepared spell for you, and one that you can cast proficiency bonus times per long rest without expending a spell slot. This alone is fairly potent, especially if you'd not taken the Guidance Cantrip already, but you'll also get another interesting feature at second level your starry form. Similarly to what the Spore Druid is able to do, this feature will act as an alternative to your usual wild shape ability, except that it can be enacted as a bonus action rather than an action. While in this starry form, you'll retain your ability to cast spells and perform normal actions, but your body becomes luminous for 10 minutes as you choose a constellation that provides various benefits. The archer allows you to make ranged spell attacks with an arrow of light against a creature within 60 feet, dealing 1d8 plus your wisdom modifier and radiant damage. The chalice grants you or another creature within 30 feet 1d8 plus your wisdom modifier and temporary hit points when you cast a spell that restores hit points of another creature and the dragon allows you to treat intelligence and wisdom checks along with concentration checks rolled 9 or lower as a 10 on the d20. These different constellations certainly have some standouts depending on what your druid is aiming to do within the party composition, but things get even better later. First, at 6th level you'll gain an ability that allows you to use your reaction to either add or subtract a d6 to or from an attack roll, ability check, or saving throw of a creature within 30 feet of you depending on if you roll odds or evens on a die when you finish a long rest. Though you don't get to choose, this feature is extremely powerful, all aside from the awesome flavor of consulting your star chart for omens. At 10th level, the 1d8 damage and healing of the archer and chalice starry forms become 2d8 and the dragon gives you a flying speed of 20 feet with hover. But what's really sweet is the fact that you can now also change your constellation for free at the start of each of your turns so you always get the benefit you need. Finally, 14th level sees you become incorporeal, giving you resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage. Overall, this subclass is pretty fantastic and is a worthwhile departure from the typical druid mechanics of utilizing your beast form, which you can still do in a pinch, by the way. So really, what are you losing here? Coming back down to Earth, we have the Circle of the Land, another intriguing druid subclass that offers eight great options depending on your preferred flavor. These mystics and sages are very much shaped by the landscapes they hail from, as they can originate from arctic, coastal, desert, forest, grassland, mountain, swamp, and underdark terrains, each with their own unique, always prepared, expanded spell lists of eight spells. Bear with me as I list some standout options for each one. Arctic includes entries like Hold Person, Slow, Ice Storm, and Cone of Cold. Coastal has Mirror Image, Misty Step, Control Water, and Scrying. Desert brings Blur, Blight, Hallucinatory Terrain, and Insect Plague. Forest gives Call Lightning, Plant Growth, Divination, and Tree Stride. Grasslands give Invisibility, Pass Without Trace, Haste, and Insect Plague. Mountain Petals, Spike Growth, Lightning Bolt, Stone Skin, and Pass Wall. Swamp Cells, Acid Arrow, Stinking Cloud, Locate Creature, and scrying, and Underdark Unearths, Web, Gaseous Form, Greater Invisibility, and Cloud Kill. Whew, that was a lot. Though I can't go into detail on each of these, I'm sure you can tell that there are no bad options here. And in addition to these spell lists, you'll also get an additional Druid Cantrip and the ability to regain a number of spell slots over a short rest, the combined level of which cannot be more than half your druid level, rounded up, with none of the slots being above 5th level. While this is only available to you once per long rest, you can easily see how this subclass seeks to empower your druid as a raw spellcaster with more options to dish out damage and offer more utility for your party. From there, you'll eventually become immune to the extra movement and damage of plants incurred by non-magical difficult terrain, as well as gain advantage against the saving throws of magical plants that impede movement, become immune to being charmed or frightened by elementals and fey, as well as immune to poison and disease outright, and eventually force beasts and plants that attack you to make a wisdom saving throw against being forced to send their attacks elsewhere. While the latter features of the subclass are quite niche and not likely as potent as some other options we'll cover, it is fairly front-loaded with some great options for expanded spell lists and a nice movement ability that lends itself to some difficult terrain shenanigans with your own spells. Now it's time for us to talk about the Moon Druid. As a fair warning, this subclass has long been hailed as the best option available since D&D 5e came into existence. No power creep here, it's just always been broken. 
These druids exemplify the purest and most powerful form of the wild shape feature, as right away you'll be able to use your wild shape as a bonus action instead of an action, and further use another bonus action while in wild shape to expend a spell slot and regain 1d8 hit points per level of the spell slot expended. This alone would already be pretty potent and biting at the heels of what the Circle of Stars offers us, but as early as second level when you take this subclass, you'll get a huge upgrade via the ability to transform into creatures up to one challenge rating instead of just one quarter. That's a big leap that brings the druid's wild shape feature from a sizable boost to power and utility to an absolutely broken one at this level. Once you hit sixth level, the beast form challenge rating limit will simply be equal to your druid level divided by three, rounded down, which is still a huge step up from what's possible with the base class, but you'll still get magical attacks in your beast form for the purpose of overcoming resistance and immunity to non-magical attacks. Honestly, if you were planning to wild shape for combat, this is one feature that the base class is somewhat sorely lacking. It feels a bit odd that druids don't get this outright, but that's just one more reason to consider the Circle of the Moon. And just as your wild shapes begin to be a bit less potent in combat than what you might be used to, 10th level grants us the ability to transform into an air, earth, fire, or water elemental instead by using two of our wild shape uses. Not only do these forms offer a pretty nice leap in damage and staying power, but they also bring new utility to the table that wasn't there prior. And yes, Sage Advice does say that the attacks from these count as magical too, despite them not being beast stat blocks. Finally, the subclass does fall off a bit at 14th level when you become able to cast the Alter Self spell at will, which really just feels like a lesser form of our wild shape to begin with, right? While this might be useful for social encounters to some degree, you probably won't care because the subclass features up to this point are just so incredibly powerful that you can't ignore them. This subclass is so absolutely broken that it makes the others, even Circle of Stars, feel like less than what a druid should be. If you're wanting to place a focus on your wild shape ability, and chances are that your druid will be, the Circle of the Moon should always be a front runner. Next up, let's cover the Circle of the Shepherds. These druids most often spend their days protecting animals, spirits, and fey creatures that may not be strong enough to defend themselves. And seemingly in return, they are one of the best summoners in the game. At second level, you'll learn to speak unerringly with beasts and fey creatures, as well as pick up Sylvan as a language you can speak speak, read, and write. This is a nice touch for flavor that certainly comes in handy if you find yourself in the right situation for it. But what we really like from this subclass is the spirit totem feature that comes online at this point. As a bonus action, you can summon an incorporeal spirit within 60 feet that creates an aura in a radius of 30 feet that has various effects depending on the type of totem you summon. Each lasting for one minute when summoned, the bear spirit gives creatures of your choice within the area temporary hit points equal to five plus your druid level and advantage on strength checks and strength saving throws. The Hawk Spirit grants advantage on perception checks to you and your allies in the area, and allows you to use your reaction to grant another creature in that area advantage on their attack roll, and the Unicorn Spirit gives you and your allies advantage on all ability checks while in the area, and tacks on your Druid level to any healing spells you cast. Similarly to the Circle of Stars, each of these options will come in handy depending on the situation and how you want to use your Druid, but these end up coupling really well to help increase the staying power and usefulness of your summon spells, which get a nice boost in addition at 6th level. As a mighty summoner, beasts and fey you conjure come into being with 2 extra hit points per hit die it has, and the damage they deal from natural weapons is considered magical. This will just stack on even more game-breaking antics when you unlock spells like conjure animals and conjure woodland beings, but We'll touch on that in just a moment. For now, know that 10th level gives us a massive boost to our spirit totem's effectiveness in combination with our summons, as when one of them ends their turn within a spirit totem's aura, the creature regains a number of hit points equal to half your druid level, which is going to be pretty significant at 10th level. Finally, at 14th level, when you are dropped to zero hit points or incapacitated against your will, you'll immediately gain the benefits of the Conjure Animal spell cast at 9th level, as four beasts of your choice that are challenge rating two or lower 
follower appear within 20 feet of you and protect you from harm for an hour once per long rest. While this subclass's mileage may vary if you're not trying to build your druid as a summoning spellcaster to some degree, it is fantastic for that purpose and provides some excellent boons to your abilities the whole way through. We'll round things out with the Circle of Wildfire that offers a healthy reminder that nature isn't just green plants and wild animals. It's also represented in the raging infernos that coincidentally can bring about new life when they occur naturally. So from the start, you'll gain an expanded spell list of spells that are always prepared, including entries like Burning Hands, Scorching Ray, Revivify, and Fire Shield. Additionally, you'll gain a Wildfire Spirit creature that you can summon as an action with a use of your Wild Shape. The creature appears within 30 feet and imposes a deck save on each creature within 10 feet of it against 2d6 fire damage. The spirit itself doesn't have all that much to write home about when it comes to its just 13 AC and 5 plus 5 times your druid level in hit points, though it does have a 30 foot fly speed with hover, immunity to fire damage, and the charmed, frightened, grappled, prone, and restrained conditions. It has dark vision out to 60 feet, it uses your proficiency bonus, and can attack by hurling a flaming seed at a range of 60 feet to deal 1d6 plus your proficiency bonus in fire damage. But what really makes this spirit worth its salt is its fiery teleportation ability that can bring along any number of willing creatures within 5 feet of it for a 15 foot teleport as it leaves any remaining creatures with a deck save against 1d6 plus your proficiency bonus in fire damage. Being able to pull your allies out of danger while dealing splash damage to your enemies using just a bonus action to command it isn't that bad at all, even if the damage itself doesn't scale all that well. After all, this is just level 2. At 6th level, you'll gain an extra d8 and extra damage for fire spells or hit points for healing spells when your wildfire spirit is summoned. Later, you'll become able to spark magical flames in the space where creatures die within 30 feet of you or your spirit that either heal an ally for 2d10 plus your wisdom modifier or damage an enemy by the same amount when you spend your reaction to do so after a creature occupies the space. Your uses of this are limited to your proficiency bonus per long rest, but it can come in handy if you're able to use it tactically to grant healing to your allies and deal extra fire damage to your enemies. And at 14th level, your spirit can save you from death once per long rest if you fall to zero hit points while the spirit is within 120 feet of you as it falls to zero instead and sees you regain half your hit points immediately and rise to your feet. Overall, the Circle of Wildfire Druid is nothing if not flavorful. I do really love the idea of fire being a damaging force as well as a healing one, but many of the features end up only being powerful if you can find the right situations for them. I wouldn't call it niche, but the Circle of Wildfire is certainly well balanced and evocative in terms of roleplay and flavor. Now, as we exit our coverage of subclasses, you'll want to take a moment to wild shape that subscribe button from its red form to the super stealthy gray form and invoke some prime savagery on the like button while you're down there. Once you've done that, let's cover one more level 2 feature that we just happen to have access to as an optional rule. Thanks to Tasha, we gained the ability to cast the Find Familiar spell without material components, using one of our wild shapes so long as it takes the form of a fey instead of a beast. Realistically, we may not want to use this super often since the familiar only sticks around for a number of hours equal to half our druid level, and our wild shape uses tend to be fairly significant for us unless we're about to short rest anyway. Still, it's nice to have one of the best spells in the game for free as we finally move on to level 3, which mostly sees us gain access to second level spells. So with that in mind, you may want to consider Healing Word, Fairy Fire, Good Berry, Moonbeam, and Spike Growth for your spells up to this point. Longtime viewers of the channel know that I usually only note 3 or 4 spell options at various points, but the Druid has a lot of different directions you can move in. Healing Word helps bolster your healing by using a bonus action to keep your allies from falling unconscious. Fairy Fire can go a long way in helping land attacks while in your wild shape, Good Berry is great for extra healing before a long rest, and can even be combined with a little bit of Life Cleric multiclassing for ridiculously strong healing power, Moonbeam offers some quintessential consistent damage while in wild shape, and Spike Growth can be absolutely nasty when combined with some tactical smarts or forced movement. Honestly, you'll probably end up preparing all of these at various points regardless of your build, but at level 4 we'll get the upgrade to our wild shape ability that we detailed earlier 
Center, as well as an ability score improvement or feat, and one more optional feature from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything that allows us to swap out a cantrip we know from this class with another from the Druid spell list anytime we would gain an ability score improvement or feat. Coincidentally, that means we'll get a chance again at 8th, 12th, 16th, and 19th level. But before we move on, let's take some time to look at some more options for our wild shape now that we can transform into a beast of one half CR or lower, unless you're a moon druid, because they're just broken as hell. The ape for some nice damage dealing options in combat and a climbing speed. The reef shark, since our druid can now wild shape into something with a swim speed. The war horse, strictly for its 60 feet of movement speed. And the crocodile, for a decent grappling option that can drag enemies into bodies of water and drown them there. Don't look at me, nature is scary. Now, to get the most out of these in combat, you'll still want to be thinking about how to best couple all of these forms with concentration spells or spells with long durations that offer some sustained damage or helpful effects on the battlefield. Field, as in the case of the aforementioned Fairy Fire and Moonbeam spells. That said, our next feature comes online at level 8, when our base druid's wild shape finally catches up to what the moon druid has had since second level. Absolutely insane. Anyway, some good options for CR1 beasts might include the Direwolf that boasts more hit points and a higher AC than the popular brown bear, along with pack tactics, a cool knockdown effect on their attack, and advantage on perception checks. The Giant Vulture is another option now that you can have a flying speed in your beast form since it's only a little slower than the Giant Owl and has pack tactics instead. The Giant Spider improves on the Giant Wolf Spider and offers a cool web attack with no save for restraining your enemy and the giant hyena is awesome for tearing through a bunch of weak enemies really fast with its rampage ability while boasting a nice pile of hit points. Now, do keep in mind that rules as written, you'll have to see these creatures first before you can wild shape into them. So while you're unlikely to have all of these options at your disposal, your DM should be kind enough to let you pick up one or two as you progress through your druid levels. Speaking of progression, at this point, you'll finally have access to third and fourth level spells and you'll definitely want to prepare Call Lightning, Sleet Storm, Conjure Woodland Beings, and Polymorph. Call Lightning specifically is a staple in terms of spells with nice recurring damage while you concentrate on it in wild shape form. And Sleet Storm is an option that many players forget about that is absolutely devastating for casters that need line of sight and concentration for their spells. Polymorph is always a great choice as it basically extends your ability to wild shape into something else while also giving you the option to transform an ally into something truly devastating or an enemy into something unthreatening to just end a combat. But the best of these is easily Conjure Woodland Beings, even if most DMs won't let you do much of what makes it so absolutely broken and rightly so. This spell goes so absolutely crazy for this level of play as you can conjure a small army of boggles to trip or restrain your enemies by spraying out a bunch of oil while also being able to open a dimensional rift that it can use to bother enemies at range. Blink dogs are also great for popping in to attack unsuspecting enemies from 40 feet out with their teleport. Sprites are fairly able archers that can poison or knock enemies unconscious and can even turn invisible so they can surprise an enemy that didn't know you had them floating about, and pixies don't even get me started on pixies. Too late, these tiny fey creatures come prepped with quite a few spells that they can cast once per day, including fly and polymorph. So assuming your DM doesn't slap you in the face for this, you can summon eight of these and have them target you and three of your party members with the spell of polymorph and fly so you can turn into flying T-Rexes. Yeah, that's just dumb. <laughs> Honestly, the intended use for the spell is for the DM to choose what you summon anyway, but if you bring them a nice gift, they might let you do what you want. At the very least, it's great to have extra bodies on the battlefield, and at most, you can completely dismantle an encounter with some of these great options. There's even a lot more that you can do without this spell. I won't even suggest you look into conjure animals to drop a forest load of creatures onto an enemy from 60 feet in the air. Just don't. <laughs> From here, things get a little quiet for our friend the Druid. Unless you're a Moon Druid and can continue to unlock better and better beast stat blocks, of course. For the rest of us peasants, we'll fast forward to 18th level where your Druid will gain a timeless body that allows you to age only one year for every 10 year period. I hope you didn't start your campaign out on your 100th birthday. And of course, we'll have access to 9th level spells at this point too. So let's take another look at some options for the late game here. You'll probably want to familiarize yourself with Insect Plague, Summon Draconic 
Aquatic Spirit, Heal, and Foresight to name a few. Insect Plague gives you an area of difficult terrain and deals pretty good area damage that you can concentrate on in Wild Shape. Summon Draconic Spirit is one of the best summon spells in the game from Fizzban's Treasury of Dragons that I go over in this video. Heal aptly cements the Druid as a legitimately potent option for a party healer, and Foresight is plainly the best buff spell in the game. And all of this gets even sweeter when you realize that 18th level also sees us able to cast Druid spells while in Wild Shape so long as it doesn't require material components. But even that becomes a bit moot when you graduate to your 20th level in this fantastic class. At this point, you become an Arch Druid that can use your Wild Shape an unlimited number of times and cast spells without using verbal, somatic, and material components that aren't consumed by the spell itself in both your normal form and your beast form. After all of these absolutely broken features and spells that only don't work as well because the DM says so, we're given a crazy powerful capstone on top of that? No matter how good you thought this class was coming in, there can be no question now that Druid can easily fill just about any role within a party as an infiltrator, a problem solver, a healer, a damage dealer, a tank, and so much more. So what would your ideal Druid look like? Let me know down in the comments and don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel for more guides like this. Now, go out there and make some chaos.